thank you Scott for the great introduction you can always count on Scott to uh, to uh, give you a great introduction um, so this is probably the last talk before lunch so I'm going to show a lot of pictures and I'm going to talk about how you can sort of use uh, modern day computer vision machine learning techniques and uh, big data digital data to study interesting questions in social sciences um, can you hear me well uh, so this is uh, a talk about understanding urban change understanding how the built environment in cities is evolving using uh, google street view images and computer vision algorithms and this is a joint work with uh, ed glazer here at harvard economics and uh, Scott and uh, my MIT Media Lab advisors uh, Ramesh Raskar and Cesar Hidalgo. Uh, so before sort of get into the, the work itself, I want to uh, give you a general sense of, uh, of what this, uh, this field is enabling us to do at the moment. Uh, so what's happened in the past decade or so is that there is sort of a boom in uh, geospatial big visual data. There is a lot of data available online about uh, the built environment and our physical world. And this uh, imagery has been captured at the street level from, uh, from, uh, from airplanes and drones and from satellites. So we have uh, so-called street view imagery captured by vehicles driving around streets, available for countries around the world, captured by companies like Google, Microsoft, uh, Tencent, and so on. There's also aerial imagery uh, where you fly an aircraft or a drone uh, to capture images of the cities and, uh, and, and even uh, farms and a lot of other different parts of the world. And there's finally satellite imagery, which started with government data on, on weather satellites and so on, but now we have private companies collecting satellite uh, data by using low cost sensors, uh, which can give you high resolution and coverage. So there's a sort of a flood of digital data about uh, our physical world. And there's a lot of opportunity, both in the academic world and in the commercial world, uh, to make use of this data. Uh, and that's because this trend is, has been paralleled by significant advances in computer vision machine learning. So in maybe past five to six years, uh, deep learning has really taken off as a, as a, uh, as a technique to uh, really understand images uh, with high accuracy. And we can do things like understanding uh, what objects are in a picture and which, what, where are they and what they are. Uh, we, have, we can do so-called semantic segmentation where uh, we can essentially give pixel-wise labels to images uh, telling you what objects are present where uh, and uh, you can essentially segment the picture into different, different object categories. And we also have uh, good methods to uh, generate captions for images describing what's in the picture or even uh, things like visual question answering where you can ask a question about the picture and the computer can give you a pretty accurate answer. So uh, basically we now have pretty accurate algorithms uh, which can uh, help, help you solve your, uh, your computer vision problem. And, and I think some of the speakers are going to talk about this in more detail in this conference as well. Uh, so what this has enabled us is that uh, now we have an opportunity to sort of do better measurement about our world using imagery. Uh, so for example, uh, we can uh, try to measure socioeconomic indicators, things like population density or income from satellite or aerial images. An example of that is uh, Facebook's uh, project where they are measuring population density in Africa using satellite images and using this information to figure out where they can uh, where they can launch their free internet project. Uh, you can uh, measure commercial activity, you can measure things like oil storage or retail activity, uh, count number of cars in parking lots, things like that from, from satellite images. And this has been uh, now increasingly done in, in, in the, in the in, in, in industry. Uh, you can measure things like quality of infrastructure, you can measure quality of water, transportation, housing stocks, so on. And you can also measure uh, perceptual metrics for places. You can measure how people are perceiving places, if some place looks lively or more beautiful and so on. Uh, so in summary, uh, this combination of uh, availability of data and good algorithms is now enabling us to obtain lots of interesting measurements about the physical world, about people, places, and activity uh, using digital data. Uh, so my work has focused on uh, street view imagery, which are images of streets collected by vehicle mounted cameras. Most of you are probably familiar with this. You have used Google Street View or some other Street View uh, product. 
And, uh, and the interesting thing about this is a lot of this data is available for academic use uh, if, you are, uh, if you want to analyze this. Uh, and particularly Google Street View has, uh, has a pretty good coverage of the world, uh, mostly in developed countries, but it has covered more than 100 countries in the world. And uh, they have images available uh, from uh, lots of different parts of the world. And what this has enabled in the past uh, few years is that social scientists are realizing that instead of conducting field surveys or neighborhood studies, they can conduct virtual audits of, of, of places. So there has, been, uh, there has been a trend of, sort of doing systematic observations of, of cities using street view data either by trained sociologists or urban scientists or by using crowdsourcing tools. So if I'm a sociologist and I want to study uh, the relationship between say urban disorder and, uh, and uh, outcomes, health outcomes, I can essentially go on street view, uh, code up locations to figure out where is uh, more disorder and then I can connect disorder data sets uh, to then study uh, the question I'm interested in. And uh, several examples of this people have used uh, street view in public health, in sociology, in urban planning and so on. And this has led to a lot of uh, studies uh, uh, you know, in this area. Uh, the problem with this kind of uh, methodology of conducting virtual audits is obviously restricted resolution and scale. If I'm, uh, if I'm manually looking at pictures, there's only so much area I can cover. And uh, so that really limits uh, the throughput and uh, the scope of my studies. Uh, so we were interested in trying to see how we can use computer vision methods in this context. How we can use an algorithm uh, to conduct virtual audits and then use this to answer uh, questions in social science. And uh, the data we use is uh, it's called uh, the Google Street View Time Machine, which is a time series data of, of Street View images captured across several years and there are pictures available starting year 2007 going back, uh, going to all the way till uh, 2016. So your picture available almost every year of, of, of the place taken from the same viewpoint uh, with pretty much the same image quality. So uh, this has really captured uh, the urban change in, in, in the country or like across the world. And so to give an example, this is, uh, this is Brooklyn, uh, Kent Avenue uh, is the location you see in 2007 and uh, not much going on here, there was probably some construction happening and this is the same place in 2014 where now it has been completely built up, there are people walking on the street and the place has been completely transformed. So this kind of transformation uh, has been uh, captured uh, by Google Street View and, uh, and so we decided how can we use algorithm to try to quantify and measure such urban change across cities. Uh, so we collected uh, Google Street View data going back to 2007 and we had images from five cities, uh, Baltimore, DC, uh, Boston, Detroit and New York and uh, we essentially collected uh, every single street block. So we had picture from year 2007, 2014 uh, for, uh, for every street block in these cities. And uh, so uh, this has uh, you know, documented both sort of urban growth and urban decline as you can see in these examples. But then the question remains, how do we quantify urban appearance? How do we uh, give a number to how much a place has improved or declined? And for this, we used uh, this metric called street score, which I had developed earlier in my PhD. Uh, so street score is essentially a metric for perceived safety of a place. It's algorithm which can look at a picture and tell you how safe this place would look to a human observer. And so let me tell you a bit more about how, uh, how the street score was developed. Uh, so we essentially created a crowdsource game. We uh, created an online game where we showed people pictures from Street View uh, side by side. So we had 4,000 pictures from New York, Boston to other cities. And we asked people to pick one of them in response to question, which place looks safer. So people would come to our website, they would click on pictures and they would give us uh, this un annotated data. And so this game was online for about a few months and we collected more than uh, 200,000 pairwise comparison from 8,000 participants. So we had uh, these uh, responses. Uh, then we were able to convert these pairwise comparisons to rank scores. And for that, we used this algorithm called Microsoft TrueSkill, uh, which is used to uh, rank players in online games. And so the idea in a two-player game here is pretty simple. You have uh, each image 
each image's score is modeled as a, as a Gaussian uh, variable with, with a mean standard deviation and every time uh, you get a comparison between two images the score is updated. The algorithm becomes more and more confident about, about its average score and the standard deviation also changes. And so after several such uh, comparisons uh, the algorithm converges to a stable score uh, for this image and it essentially represents an aggregate score for perceived safety based on uh, uh, the people's uh, people's comparisons. And uh, so after we did that uh, we are able to look at some examples here. So here you, you are looking at some uh, examples of MAS scored by people and so these are low scoring examples and you can see that uh, places like uh, warehouses, empty streets and parking lots and so on they score low and uh, in contrast uh, uh, busy streets uh, you know office buildings and uh, these brownstone houses here or, or uh, single family homes sort of these nicer areas score higher. So the algorithms the people's aggregate perception sort of seems uh, you know what we can expect. Uh, so now we have this sort of training data set of, uh, of several hundred images and their, uh, their scores for perceived safety. Uh, we can train a computer vision model to predict its, its street score, its score for perceived safety. So we have Im uh, several images and then uh, we obtain uh, their image features derived from pixels and then we can train a regression model to then predict its, its score. So in this case we use a support vector regression model. So the algorithm can take these several Im these many image pairs with their scores and then predict the score for a new image. So I won't go into too many details but uh, to summarize our method uh, we uh, take an image and we perform uh, so called semantic segmentation. So we are assigning a, a, a pixel a label to each pixel for belonging to each of these four categories which is sky, building, ground and trees uh, and uh, then we extract uh, features based on their textures, colors and, uh, and shapes. So these are sort of pretty standard older computer vision features which are used to, uh, uh, to sort of quantize the different, uh, different kind of texture, shapes and colors presented in the image. So once we have these features from each images we can train a, a regression model uh, to then uh, predict the, the street score for out of sample images. And the prediction performs pretty decent, we get about 60 percent R squared and uh, the algorithm uh, is able to pretty uh, reasonably able to predict uh, the scores for images. So uh, when we had that uh, this algorithm we scored many uh, street blocks from, uh, from different cities and it is available on our website. So it is an interactive map where you can go and click on location and then uh, it will display the pictures uh, uh, perceived safety score based on this aggregate perception of all these people. Um, anyway, so now that we have this kind of method to be able to quantify urban appearance, uh, what we decide to do is to compute the street score for each of the images in our data set where we had a picture from 2007, 2014 and then compute the, the difference between the street scores. So as you can see uh, as this place has um, had new constructions and so on the street score has gone up from 1.8 to 7.2 and we can essentially compute the difference between the street score and uh, so our assumption was that this change in perception can serve as a proxy for physical urban change. So if the change in perception goes up then this place has improved physically and if the change in perception goes down the place has declined physically. And so this uh, so we wanted to test this assumption first, we want to check if this actually makes sense uh, and so well I guess so there is another step where uh, before we could compute these changes for all the image pairs we had to get rid of uh, images which uh, you know which had things like overexposure or uh, image pairs we had where we had pictures uh, where one image was occluded by a big truck or other vehicle or we had examples where we had uh, houses being occluded by trees and so we had to develop vision algorithms which could uh, get rid of all these image pairs where there was uh, where it wasn't possible to uh, compute the change between the images. So for example in this in this case there is no meaningful change between the two pictures except the tree uh, is not there anymore but uh, we, we didn't want to focus on seasonal changes like trees and weather so we developed algorithms which could essentially discard such image pairs from our calculations. Uh, so as I said our assumption is that this change in perception can serve as a proxy for physical change. 
So to test this, uh, uh, this uh, assumption, we ran several validation studies. So in the first study, uh, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk, where we showed uh, a me Mechanical Turk users uh, two image pairs. So we showed them an image pair on the left, an image pair on the right, and we asked them which of these pairs had a larger physical change. And once we connected many, uh, once we collected many comparisons from uh, Turkers, we could convert these to again ranked scores using TrueSkill, and we could compare those. Uh, those uh, uh, scores to our street uh, street change score. So the idea was that do uh, online uh, crowd workers agree with our definition of, of physical change? Do they do they think that there's a place is improved when our algorithm says it does improve? And we found that there was a uh, there was a pretty good uh, correlation between our our score and and uh, the 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 perception of the the mechanical Turk workers. So in this, we ran another uh, study, another human study, where we uh, where we showed these images to uh, graduate students in MIT's urban planning department, and we asked them to classify images, image pairs, into positive or negative physical change, and we checked if this sort of binary classification matched with our uh, physical change uh, uh, scores by thresholding our scores into positive and negative. And again, we found that there was about 74% agreement between uh, the uh, the students and between our our algorithm and interestingly what we found is that there was a much lower agreement for a negative change uh, than the positive change and that was a result of uh, the students thinking that a demolition of a blighted property is a positive change while well, algorithm thinks that if something has been torn down it's a bad change a negative change so that was an interesting uh, fact we learned from this study uh, next, we also conducted a validation study using actual infrastructure development data. So from the city of Boston, we collected data on all new buildings uh, being built uh, between uh, during our sample period and we, uh, we looked at the correlation between uh, the street change in neighborhoods in Boston versus uh, how much total square footage was built in each of these neighborhoods as reported by the city. And uh, we found that there was a very significant positive correlation. And uh, uh, when we had, there was a, a sta one standard deviation increase in the log of square footage built, there was about half a, s a standard deviation increase in street change. So the actual physical infrastructure uh, uh, development was being reflected in our score, which was what we hoped for. Uh, so this validation series gave us confidence that uh, this measure was actually doing the right thing and it's giving us a reasonable signal on improvement or decline in cities. Yes? Do you have data on the prices of the houses or whatever it is along the street? Because that would be a different sort of validation. Right, yeah, so I, I, I'll come to that. Yeah, we do have data. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, all right, so uh, how does this algorithm uh, sort of, you know, how does the output look like? So here are some examples where we have street blocks where there is no significant change, and then the algorithm says that there is no significant change. Uh, so this example kind of shows that the algorithm is sort of invariant to things like changes in weather or seasonal changes, which is what we designed it for. So it's not fooled by just changes in the weather or or or, or in the in the trees and so on. Uh, the algorithm thinks that there is significant positive improvement if there is new construction or improvement in streets and sidewalks. So these are reflected uh, by high scores. Uh, and so the kind of things that it, it thinks as an improvement are uh, also include upgrading where the building facade has been improved or things like new public transportation, new construction and so on. And we found several interesting examples of these in our data set. So uh, here are a couple of sort of salient examples. So one example is that the neighborhood, uh, the Edge Street neighborhood in Washington DC, where a new streetcar was built and then the, it has been surrounded by a lot of uh, new uh, apartment buildings and a new, a new supermarket and so on. And the algorithm saw a large cluster of positive physical change surrounding this new uh, public transportation infrastructure. The other sort of large cluster we saw was uh, a physical change around a High Line Park in New York City. And those of you who may not know about this, so this was a park that was built on top of an old abandoned rail railroad and then it has uh, sort of uh, spurned large growth around that 
uh, around the park and this is reflected in our data set very nicely. So uh, in other words, algorithm is sort of catching these large changes uh, driven by things like new public infrastructure, uh, new parks and uh, other kinds of, uh, other kinds of uh, infrastructure uh, uh, investments. The algorithm also captures decline. So here you're looking at some examples where places have uh, declined. So in this case, a uh, house has been demolished, the sidewalks, the, the, the lawn is now not taken care of and so on. So these are reflected in our algorithm by negative scores for street change. These are some more examples uh, for decline from different places in our data set and they were mostly uh, concentrated around Detroit and Baltimore. Um, so now that we have this kind of method to uh, quantify physical change in cities, uh, we can uh, essentially scale up this method and we can uh, capture uh, physical change across cities. So we scored uh, the street change for uh, all the 1.5 million uh, street blocks in our data set and we can then look at sort of uh, city wide trends uh, for, for physical change and also study the causes and consequences of physical change. So here we are just showing urban growth in New York City. So the red points are uh, essentially locations which uh, had uh, about four standard deviation or larger physical improvement. And so this is sh very nicely showing clusters around Brooklyn or around Highline Park or other parts of New York City where we know that there has been a lot of physical improvement. This is a similar map for, uh, for Boston where the area around MIT uh, in South Boston around Seaport and so on has been highlighted also in Alston where the new Harvard uh, construction is happening. So a lot of these interesting uh, changes that we know are happening in our city are reflected in the data set. So now that we have this data set, we aggregated the data to then uh, study uh, which neighborhoods experience physical change. So uh, we collected the street change data from five cities I explained before, and we uh, aggregated these, uh, these street block level changes to census tract. So we essentially averaged the census street score and street change measures at the census tract level and we also collected socioeconomic data from the, from the 2000 census. So we had demographic information from year 2000 and then we had uh, how much physical growth, hap physical change happened between 2007 2014. So the first question we were interested in studying is that uh, uh, what socioeconomic factors were predictive of future improvement. Uh, so to study that, we correlated uh, uh, the street change measure uh, with a variety of socioeconomic indicators and including the initial appearance or the initial street score of uh, those neighborhoods. So if you look at the regression table, uh, the sort of the interesting thing to notice is that uh, education and density were probably the most important predictive factors and things like housing cost including uh, uh, housing prices and rent were not really significant or very small. The, uh, the correlates with, uh, uh, with ethnic composition were significant but slightly smaller and then uh, uh, things like vacancy mattered a little bit. So uh, but what sort of pops out is the two important factors were uh, the share of college educated adults and the population density in the census tracts. Uh, so uh, we looked at those more carefully and this regression shows that that uh, the two sort of most important predictive factors were education and density and uh, uh, these sort of these, uh, these findings uh, are compatible with uh, human capital agglomeration theory which claims that a lot of skilled people living uh, close to each other is uh, what causes innovation and growth which has been forwarded by uh, several uh, economists. So uh, it was interesting to find uh, support for that theory. Uh, the next sort of theory we tested was uh, tipping theory of urban change. So the tipping theory claims uh, that neighborhoods that are already doing well, uh, they, their growth accelerates at almost an exponential scale and neighborhoods are not, they're not doing well, they do not improve and they in fact go into spiral of decline. We did not find much support for that. Uh, we found that the, the neighborhoods that are already doing well, they also, they kept doing well and they, they are the ones that experienced the largest improvement. But we did not find that neighborhoods that did not do well uh, declined. We found only that they improved less. And we found almost a linear trend uh, between the initial appearance and uh, the change, in, the positive change in appearance. 
Um, so the next area we looked at was the impact of location. Uh, so we wanted to see how, how much does the location of a neighborhood matter uh, to its, its, its physical improvement. And so this is led to the invasion theory in urban sociology, which claims that neighborhoods that are close to downtowns uh, tend to improve more and neighborhoods that are surrounded by other neighborhoods that are doing well will also tend to improve because of spillover effects. And we found support for both of these. Uh, we used uh, the distance to uh, the central business district or distance to downtown as a measure of uh, uh, as a measure of looking at how close is it to the to uh, to jobs and uh, we looked at the appearance and the demographic characteristics of surrounding neighborhoods to see how do the how are these factors related to uh, physical growth in these neighborhoods and as you can see, for example, in specification four, the closer they are to downtown, the more improvement there was, and also the appearance of surrounding neighborhoods and uh, the education and density levels in surrounding neighborhoods were very significantly correlated uh, with, uh, with physical growth. So to summarize, neighborhoods are more likely to improve when they were close to downtown and or other neighborhoods which are perceived as safe and contain educated and uh, highly dense educated populations. Um, finally, we also looked at a so called filtering hypothesis, uh, which and I won't go into much detail, but uh, this hypothesis relates the age of the building stock to physical growth. And we looked at the average age of, uh, we looked at the share of buildings built between different decades and we saw, we tried to see if there was a relationship between uh, the composition of building stock and physical growth. And interestingly, what we found was even though the the perception, the appearance was correlated with either new buildings or really old buildings, but it, there was no really significant relationship between the, the composition of housing stock and physical urban growth. Uh, so to summarize our findings, uh, what we found is that positive urban change occurs in geographically and physically attractive areas which have concentration of educated populations and this is sort of illustrated in this figure. Uh, for Brooklyn, where you're looking at uh, the density and education of these of uh, of different neighborhoods and their physical growth between the during the sample period. Um, so uh, yeah, so in this work, I described uh, how we can understand physical urban change using Google Street View and computer vision, and we introduced a new measure for physical urban change, and we uh, we created a new data set which contains more than 1.6 million street blocks from five cities. And what we found is that positive urban change occurs in geographically and physically attractive areas with uh, dense, highly educated populations. And our uh, website uh, contains. Uh, has a lot of data and visualization. So if you're interested in finding more about our project, please uh, please visit our website. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, did you consider, it seems like it's a spatial data. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, so in all regressions, we correct for uh, for spatial errors. Okay. So uh, yeah, so yes, yes, we we consider the yes, yes, Alex. Right. What was your question again? Sorry. Just like how much disaggregation do you do? Because I feel like oh. the average is in these regressions are really misleading. Right. Um, I mean, we aggregate the data at the track level. Is that your question? No, but I mean, but when you like do the regressions, sure. right, you say like, oh, you know, which like, does the presence of you know, buildings between the jump in 1900 Right. I mean, for New York, we have uh, borough level fixed effects, not neighborhood level, and uh, I guess we could look more carefully at if if that is, there is variation among areas. Yeah. 
like we can talk more after uh in the surveys you sent out how much agreement was there between the people who answered the questions there was about 80% agreement Sure. Can you tell me, tell us some, what else is street score actually judging other than just the number of buildings? Right, yeah, so here it's, you know, it's showing extreme examples, but it can uh, detect upgrading, things like if I you know, improved my lawn or if I put a new, put a, uh, improved my building facade and, uh, or if the, if the city paved over the street or you know, it improved the sidewalk or put a new bus stop or even in decline if, if the, if uh, you know my house is showing blight, so these kind of finer things uh, are detected by the algorithm. Yeah, I think I had some examples um, somewhere. Yeah, so these are again I guess extreme, but it can detect uh, even finer upgrading things and so on. Yeah. Uh Thank you very much, great job. Um, if I got it correctly, instead of the actual safety or safeness, you're measuring the perception of safety. That's correct. And that could be very much related to the emptiness or non-emptiness of the picture. So what I'm saying is that a good part of this could be just measuring a psychological effect that uh, the, the talkers are providing, like introducing to the data and therefore your model. I'm sorry, I'm sure I understand. So, uh, the mo your model I, is... I couldn't, I couldn't hear you clearly, yeah, sorry. So, your model is based on the input from the talkers, right? It's based on perception, yes. Yeah, and there are, there are questions like how safe this neighborhood would be, and that could be only they, they gave higher scores to certain areas because they saw more buildings in it. And this is just a psychological effect. It might not have much to do with the actual safety. Yes, yeah, so we are only using it as a proxy for, I guess, uh, the niceness of, of, the, of the place. Yeah, we don't claim anything about the physical safety. And it just, what we are saying here that this serves as a useful proxy for uh, physical improvement or decline, as most people think of it. Um, I'd be curious how you control for um, the time of day that the picture was taken because like he was saying, I would think that my proxy for safeness would be the number of people that are in the image and if the Google street car is driving around on Sunday morning and there's no one there versus in the middle of the day uh, where there's a lot of people, I would think that would be an important factor. Yeah, we are unfortunately restricted by that because uh, we cannot control for time of the day. We and as you say, most of the images are from early mornings in these uh, in these neighborhoods. So uh, there is, I don't think there's any good way to correct for that. Yes. Hi. Um, can you compare your findings to things like with um, crime statistics? I'm sorry. Crime statistics. Oh yeah. Do you uh, so yeah, we did, and uh, so there is a. Uh, small but negative correlation uh, to property crime. So between per more perceived safety leads to less proper, is correlated with less property crime, and but there is uh, not really a significant correlation with violent crime. Uh, one more question. Um, just, uh, if you want to apply the same analysis to the city of Los Angeles, how, long, how much time does it take? I mean, is it a month project, is it a year project? So the, uh, so the current algorithm is based on training data from New York and Boston. Yeah. So it does not generalize well to West Coast cities, but we have created a new data set that can cover, that covers a uh, place like Los Angeles. And I think, I mean, it just, depending on computing power, it can take few days to a week. It, it's just an issue of how, how many computers you have. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we have a training set now that covers uh, about uh, 56 cities from 20 countries, so including lots of it in Europe. Yeah. All right, well, let's thank you again. Thanks.